Hello all, welcome to today's webcast, doing a little audio check for some people. So we will begin at the top of the hour. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the SANS webinar on Beware the Encryption Jedi Mind Trick. So I am Ken Hartman, and I'm a certified instructor for both SEC 488, which is Cloud Security Essentials, and the SEC 510 Public Cloud Security for AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud Platform. You can also follow me on Twitter at Ken G. Hartman and find me on LinkedIn as well. So before we jump into our content, I wanted to mention that um, this is um, supporting the SEC 510 Public Cloud Security for AWS Azure and Google Cloud Platform class, but that's part of a larger cloud curriculum, which we're very proud of here at SANS. So I've been talking about cloud security probably since 2014. And the root of many of these questions is, can I trust my cloud services provider? And that trust issue is actually hardwired into us. It's how we've survived through the generations because of this healthy distrust. So many people have this mistaken notion that an attacker could um, do a Tom Cruise mission and style, mission impossible style attack where they can find a hard drive that belongs to a specific cloud customer and um, escape the data center and go into their bat cave and plug it into a forensic workstation and um, get all that customer's information that they put in the cloud. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. First of all, there is amazing physical security at these data centers, but above and beyond that, when you upload a large file into a cloud service, such as, for example, S3, and the cloud service provider is going to slice that file up into shards. And then what they're going to do is they're going to encrypt those shards and store those shards in multiple different servers in multiple different availability zones. So that way they can um, make those promises of high availability, high resiliency to you. So what exactly 
do I mean by the Jedi mind trick? Well, I think that there's many salespeople, many marketing people that think that encryption is a magic bullet. So, oh yeah, you can trust us because we use encryption. So whenever you hear that, I think your answer should be, well, that's fine and good, but how do you use encryption? How do you manage the keys? Let's talk about the encryption life cycle, right? And everything from generating a secure key to protecting that key, rotating the key, and so forth. So that's the whole premise of today's talk is to give you ideas as to how to delve in deeper into encryption. But first, let me start off by saying encryption is hard. And I think that's actually why marketing people have discovered that it is an effective mind trick. It, you know, and I'm not really trying to slam marketing people because they don't understand encryption either. And uh, while this talk isn't necessarily intended to turn you into a cryptography expert, what we're trying to do here is to give you additional things to talk about as you're vetting your cloud service providers. And let me start by framing the question, why do we use encryption in the first place? And the reason is to control access. So how else can we control access? Well, of course, zero trust is another big marketing buzzword. And a lot of people that are talking about zero trust don't really know what it means. Um, so I have a very simplified uh, way of explaining zero trust. And it's essentially this. If system A doesn't need to talk to system B, then we don't even allow network connectivity. But if system A does need to talk to system B, then we require strong access control. So the point that I'm making is that sometimes encryption is not always the best means of enforcing access control. We might uh, want to use network segmentation as an example, or we might want to use network segmentation in addition to encryption. And since I'm talking about security controls, let's pause for a moment and think, what exactly is a security control? So as a SANS instructor, I'm pretty big on precise terminology. And uh, so a security control really is simply a countermeasure. And I also like to emphasize that there's no such thing as a perfect security control. Not even multi-factor authentication, right? Which a lot of people think multi-factor authentication is a perfect security control. But as the astute people in our audience know, there's ongoing and active research around circumventing multi-factor authentication. One of the most effective ways is actually social engineering. So in keeping with this thinking, it's important to realize that a single security control cannot mitigate all risks. In fact, a single security control can only mitigate specific risks, and then we need other security controls to mitigate the other risks. So that's part of the thinking that I want to impart as we go along throughout this discussion. So I have an axiom for you. And it's in, keep, <laughs> it's in keeping with the idea of we use encryption to control access. So the entity that holds the key controls the access. And what are we really trying to prevent here? And that would be misplaced trust. So in the field of cybersecurity, we need to be constantly on the lookout for any areas where there's misplaced trust. Because after all, that is how security incidents happen. It's because a security control does not work as expected. So for example, 
was the security control expected to mitigate the wrong risks? Was the security control properly implemented? Is the security control still operating effectively? So um, I've had discussions with multiple clients of the various organizations that I've worked for about what are they really trying to achieve by encryption. And sometimes it felt like they were just trying to implement encryption for encryption's sake without thinking about the risks that they're mitigating. So remember, a security control, which would include encryption, can mitigate certain types of risks, but cannot mitigate other risks. So here is a uh, visual that I've created to help my discussions as I've met with various clients. So first of all, um, we have various columns for different uh, encryption at different levels of the stack, if you will, all the way down to self-encrypting drives that could be used for storage. So self-encrypting drives are great in case your hard drive gets stolen or your, uh, your laptop gets stolen and is powered off. Right. If the laptop's powered on, whether you have self-encrypting drives or full disk encryption, the operating system holds the key so it can actually access that data. So that's why um, we put no for certain types of risks. And then when we get up to um, a database, so with a database, this is where the database management system is holding the key. So it's controlling the access. So that works great when um, the storage that is used for the database management system is uh, stolen or accessed by a storage administrator because the uh, database encrypted the data before it wrote to storage. However, it doesn't mitigate against the threat of a rogue database administrator. Well, why is that? Well, it's because the rogue database administrator has authenticated access to the database. So the fact that the database is encrypted is transparent to a database administrator. <coughs> Similarly, when we look at application encryption, this of course is where the application holds the key. So the application is encrypting the data before the application writes it to the database. So it's writing the cipher text to the database. So does this protect you against the rogue database administrator? Yes, because the database administrator only sees the cipher text. So I worked for Google back in the 2014, 2015 timeframe. And my role at Google was to help Google with the team that I was on it was called engineering compliance. Uh, we supported uh, their various compliance audits. So I was working with the qualified security assessor. That is the security assessor that is approved by the Payment uh, Standards Institute or the, the Payment Security Council to uh, perform audits of various organizations. And one of the questions that the QSA wanted to see was, I wanna to talk to the database administrator for uh, Google Wallet. And he had the database administrator run a query on the database. And yeah, we saw that the cardholder data was encrypted before it was written to the database, which basically is what you get with application level encryption, where the application is encrypting the data before it writes it to the database. So now there is a downside to encrypting the data before you write it to the database. And I don't know if you thought about this, but how would you sort data in a database that's encrypted? How would you query the data? How would you index it? Right, so you typically would save application level encryption 
for just your most sensitive information, such as, for example, cardholder data. So when we're looking at where and how we want to use encryption, we got to be cognizant of the trade-offs at each level. So when we're thinking about encryption, or for that matter, any security control in general, we have to ask ourselves two questions. We can think of it as two different sides to the coin. One is, well, what risks are mitigated by the security control? And the other question would be, what risks are not mitigated by the security control? Now, another thing that you might hear when you're talking to a marketing person is, we use end-to-end -end encryption. So there again, kind of like on the Princess Bride, does that really mean what you think it means? And the only way to get to the bottom of this is to ask additional follow-up questions. So, um, you know, if somebody says they're using end-to-end -end encryption, well, that's good, but now we need to know what exactly it is that they mean. And when it comes to encryption in transit, there's multiple different ways to implement encryption in transit. For example, we could have an IPsec VPN tunnel or L2T2 uh, VPN tunnel, or we could be using SSH as an example, right? So we can use uh, secure shell or secure copy, which is um, basically copying over SSH. But most of the time when we're talking about cloud services, we're talking about transport layer security, TLS, right? So... And what is the goal of TLS? The goal of TLS is to construct a, an encrypted channel between a client and a server. And it will do this by negotiating which cipher suites are to be used. So uh, once the initial connection is built up, the client uh, will, in the TLS handshake, will issue a client hello, and then the server will respond with a server hello, as well as pass its certificate to the client, right? And that certificate has the public key that will be used by the client when it uh, encrypts uh, its data uh, to the server to be used to set up a session, right? So then they'll use a symmetric session key uh, for the duration of their communication. So most of the attacks on encryption and transit are geared toward achieving a machine in the middle uh, attack position. And this is simply where the attacker impersonates the client to the server and the server to the client. So um, that's why we call it this machine in the middle, because it really takes a machine to, to pull off this encryption. And in fact, if you look at the different enhancements of, first it was secure sockets layer, which was then replaced by transport layer, you know, TLS 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, now we're on TLS 1.3. Those are to address various vulnerabilities that have been discovered in the underlying protocol. And of course, the other thing that transport layer security does is it negotiates a cipher suite. And it's called a suite because there's different ciphers for different purposes. One cipher is used for uh, key exchange, another cipher is used for the encryption, and another cipher is used for uh, validating the integrity of the encrypted message. So these cipher suites over time have been found to be vulnerable. So a certain subset of the cipher suites are vulnerable and a certain subset of the cipher suites are still considered to be secure. Now, cryptography is considered to be secure when there's no known way of breaking the security or no known vulnerabilities in the uh, cipher or the implementation of the cipher. So one of my favorite tools for assessing 
transport layer security of our various customer facing or uh, internet facing systems is Qualys SSL Labs. There's a variety of different scanners out there, but the nice thing about SSL Labs is it's hosted in the cloud and we can uh, specify the domain name of our website that we want to test. Now, if you read the fine print of SSL Labs, they say only test your systems, but we know if a system's exposed to the internet, it's constantly being hammered on. So here I did a SSL scan of SANS.org and we can see that they're getting an A+. Why is SANS getting an A+. Well, first of all, undoubtedly, whoever's administering the websites is well aware of SSL labs, so they scan it regularly and they verify that uh, it still is using all the latest and greatest uh, technologies. So different things will impact the uh, security of a website. Actually, let me um, pause for a moment and call up SSL labs just for, uh, because I, I just kind of want to talk about um, some of its features. So Right. So if we go to SSL Labs, uh, I type in sans.org. Because it was recently scanned, it will be um, we'll be able to look at existing results. So as I scan down, um, we'll see that it's looking at a variety of different tests, like um, is the certificate valid, for example? Um, uh, do they uh, use cert or do they support certificate transparency? and the different uh, ciphers that they're using, the different uh, TLS. So here they're getting uh, green because they're supporting TLS 1.2, which is still considered uh, very secure, as well as TLS 1.3. And then there's certain cipher suites that are preferred. And uh, as we go down, certain ones that are now considered weak that are still supported. And then they simulate various handshakes and so forth. So this is... Uh, uh, a pretty cool tool to use, but it does have some limitations. Let me explain the major limitation. So when we talk about end-to-end -end encryption, oops, we cannot just assume that it is encrypted throughout. So if we were to run, so if, if this was, let's say, our we had a, a software as a service vendor and uh, they gave us their URL. Maybe it was salesforce.com as an example, right? So if we ran SSL labs on there, what are we testing? We're actually just testing this link. Wherever they terminate their TLS certificate, which is often at a load balancer. Okay, so great. This link is secure. What about the link from the... Uh, load balancer to the web server. And what about the link from the web server to the database server? As somebody on the internet, we don't have visibility into what's going on inside here. Uh, instead, what we need to do is we need to, um, if it's our infrastructure, we need to verify that we are indeed using encryption at each one of the links in our internal infrastructure. If we're evaluating a software as a service vendor who's performing services for us, we need to um, get their assurances and delve into the details. So when somebody says, yeah, we're using end-to-end -end encryption, explain to have them explain to you exactly what that means. Because whenever marketing buzzwords are used, there's lots of an opportunity for confusion to occur. Now, here's a thought question for you. Which is better? We have client-side encryption and we have server-side encryption. So with client-side encryption, the encryption and the decryption of data is done on the client. So therefore, the server never has access to the keys. Because remember, 
the entity that holds the key controls the access to the data. Now, server-side encryption, this is where the server is performing the encryption. So for example, let's say we upload data into AWS S3. Uh, since about January, S3 now has default server-side encryption, which is a good move, right? Azure, Google Cloud, they've had it since the very beginning. With AWS, it previously was an option, but now it's the default. So, so if we upload data to S3, it's now encrypted. But the keys that perform that encryption, they're held in the memory of the server. The server will perform its encryption, and then as soon as it's done performing the encryption of the data using your key, it will then wipe that key from memory. So to this extent, you have to trust that cloud service provider to perform the encryption, and you're trusting that cloud service provider with the key. So some people will say, well, but I don't trust my cloud service provider. So that's why I want to use client-side encryption. Well, that will work for certain use cases, but it will totally break other use cases. So for example, let's say you're using Dropbox and you're using Dropbox really just to store files. Well, then there's really no reason not to perform client-side encryption because there's no reason Dropbox needs to be able to see the data in the clear, right? So we can encrypt our data and then upload it to Dropbox. When we need the data, we can download it from Dropbox and then we can decrypt it on the client side. That works great. But what about certain software as a service applications like salesforce.com? So I know salesforce.com has a lot of great uh, encryption options, but let's just keep it real simple. Let's say we wanted to encrypt the uh, customer name and, and address before it was written into the salesforce.com database. First of all, would the ciphertext even fit into the name and address fields? And then if it did, if you could get it to fit, you know, I know there's even techniques like format preserving encryption, but how would you use salesforce.com to print a mailing envelope for you if all they have is the ciphertext, right? So the point is, is that if you're using client-side encryption, you might break some of the functionality, which is the reason why you subscribe to that particular software as a service. Now, another thing that I like to point out when we're talking about client-side encryption versus server-side encryption is your client could be a virtual machine in the cloud. So in this case, the cloud service provider still has the key. If they were motivated enough to get at that key, they could harvest it out of the memory of your virtual machine. So the point being is that if you want to use cloud services for anything more than storing encrypted files, well, you have to trust them enough most of the time to give them access to the key. Now, the next thing that we want to think about is hardware security modules. And hardware security modules are a neat device. They're actually a physical device because as well mentioned, one of the purposes of a hardware security module is to provide for the physical security of high value keys. Because a hardware security module has to undergo validation that it was designed and implemented securely, the hardware security module is designed to provide only a limited number of cryptographic functions like generating a random key, hashing, and symmetric and asymmetric encryption. 
because as part of the extensive validation process that a hardware security module goes through, they have to examine all the code to make sure that there's no vulnerabilities or weaknesses in the code. So therefore, they want to keep that code as simple and secure as possible. So often, uh, many organizations like banks, for example, will require that they have a hardware security module as the root of their trust. Uh, that means like if they have a uh, certificate authority, the uh, private key for their certificate authority may have to be in a hardware security module. So the hardware security module is designed to protect against all types of threats, um, unauthorized access, or any disclosure of the information. And this includes by doing a side channel attack where maybe you're trying to manipulate the environment to see if you can infer anything about the underlying keys. And uh, because the hardware security module is designed to um, protect the secrets inside it, it would rather destroy the secrets inside it rather than divulge them through some sort of a side channel attack or, or as the result of tampering, such that if you tamper with the case of a hardware security module, it may destroy the secrets inside. And uh, it's for that reason that you would typically want to cluster your hardware security modules so that if one should fail as a result of either um, intentional um, abuse or um, inadvertently or power outage for that matter, you still have a highly available cluster of security modules where you can get your um, your keys in and out of, and the, the hardware security module can perform as expected. So I often, when I'm teaching, I'll talk about uh, you know how the hardware security module will destroy its secrets as being somewhat similar to a spy in the Cold War, right, where the spy would bite the uh, cyanide capsule rather than succumb to torture and reveal their country's uh, top secret information. Hardware security modules are rated according to one of four levels per the FIPS 140-2 standard. Now, level one is basic protection, and it can actually be implemented in software, but at level two and above, it does require hardware to implement. And uh, this is where we start getting into the protection against the side channel attacks at level three. And as far as the security requirements that a hardware security module is built to, they are certainly concerned about physical security as I've been mentioning. But also, um, from the very beginning, the complete design of the hardware security module is built to be secure. There's also extensive documentation to make sure that when you implement the hardware security module, that it's implemented correctly. Because remember, I was talking about misplaced trust. If you buy a expensive security module or hardware security module, or perhaps create a cluster of them, but if you don't implement it properly, you might have an exploitable weakness. And then, of course, the hardware security modules are tested through uh, external third-party laboratories as part of this rigorous validation process. Uh, in AWS, the key management systems are backed by hardware security modules. Within Azure, with our Key Vault, that is a premium upgrade. It's an option. And the same with Google Cloud. So uh, the way that I like to explain uh, the key management systems, especially in AWS, is we can think of this dashed orange line as the security boundary of the key management service. And we can think of this orange boundary or these orange boxes as the security boundary of the hardware security modules. And 
within AWS, the hardware security modules and the KMS front ends to them are in different availability zones. So, so you have a cluster that is across multiple availability zones. So when I'm talking about an availability zone, we can think of that as a logical data center. You know, each availability zone is geographically distant from the other availability zones within the region, such that if there is some sort of weather disaster impacting one availability zone, theoretically, the other availability zones are still up. And that's how AWS can offer high availability within a single zone. So next, what I want to do is talk about this key hierarchy. So uh, within the AWS documentation, they talk about an HSM key and a KMS key. Now, the KMS key used to be called a customer master key. So you might still hear people referring to the customer master key, but in the latest AWS documentation, they now refer to it as a KMS key. So we can think of this as a key hierarchy. There is an HSM key that never leaves the hardware security module boundary. By boundary, I mean that cluster of hardware security module. Its function is to wrap and unwrap the KMS key. So the KMS key, this has a function, which is to wrap and unwrap the data key. So when we say wrap and unwrap, what we mean to by that is when you say wrapping, what we mean is we're encrypting a key. When we're unwrapping it, we're decrypting a key. And it's the data key that actually does the encrypting and the decrypting of the data. So the data key would be held in the memory of the servers that implement a particular service. So for example, AWS S3, they will, have the KMS generate a data key that is wrapped and unwrapped. The, the wrapped key will be held in the KMS. I'm sorry, the wrapped key and the unwrapped key will both be sent to the um, service. In this case, I'm using S3 as an example. S3 will store the wrapped key, but then it will use the uh, generated unwrapped key to encrypt the data. As soon as it's encrypted the data, it's going to destroy that key from memory. So only the wrapped key is stored, and the wrapped key actually gets stored right alongside with the encrypted data. We'll call that envelope encryption, which we'll be talking about more on the next slide. So keys are never persisted to storage in the unwrapped state. Only when the key is encrypted will it be stored to storage. Keys are similarly, the, the keys in the plain text, they're wiped from memory immediately after being used. So that way there's less, uh, it, it's just the most secure way of, and best practices of doing it. So by, if we were to disable the KMS key, then any of the data keys that were wrapped with that KMS key would no longer be able to be unwrapped. Now, if you read the AWS KMS documentation, there might be a delay while the data key in the clear is still had, held in the server memory. But um, for the most part, it's um, fairly quick. So this KMS key really is how we can control access to the underlying data. And so some people um, think of this KMS key or the customer master key is actually the one that's encrypting the data, but it's actually encrypting the data key that encrypts the data, just to be 100% clear. So let's talk about envelope encryption. So with envelope encryption, we will have our plain text that gets encrypted by the data key. And then the resulting ciphertext will be stored. Similarly, the data key will be encrypted by the wrapping key, which in the case of AWS, they call it a 
KMS key, um, other clouds will call, continue to call it the customer master key. And then that encrypted data key will be stored right alongside the chunk of information that it encrypted. This is actually very efficient and it's um, completely okay to store the encrypted data key because it is after all encrypted with strong encryption. Another thing to be aware of, and this can cause some confusion, is that there's actually three different types of customer master keys. And remember, I, um, I'm using customer master keys as more of a universal term across all of our cloud service providers because they all use envelope encryption and they all have customer provided keys, customer managed keys, and provider managed keys. So let me explain the difference with a uh, platform or cloud service provider managed key, the cloud service provider generates the key material and they manage the life cycle of the key. With a customer managed key, the key material is actually generated by the cloud provider. So in the case of AWS, they would use the hardware security modules capability to, in the KMS service, to generate the key material. And the key material needs to be very random because if the key material is not very random, then an attacker will have an advantage and may ultimately be able to break the encryption. So that's why it's super important that the key material be very random. That's why you want to use a strong source of entropy like a hardware security module to generate that key. So with a customer managed key, the cloud service provider is still providing the key material. And for most intents and purposes, that's totally fine. But here's where the beautiful part comes in. Now the customer can manage the life cycle, which means the customer can destroy the key, which would render all the data that was encrypted by that customer master key inaccessible. And that's one of the reasons why uh, many cloud service providers require a delay between um, saying you're going to destroy the key and actually allowing the key to be destroyed. Um, uh, some call it a soft delete, right? So with AWS, you can schedule the key to be deleted between seven to 30 days out because what you don't want is somebody saying, oops, I destroyed the key and that key encrypted, let's say, a uh, hundred petabytes of data that are now rendered inaccessible. We call that cryptographic erase. So uh, that's usually why there is a delay period. Now with customer provided keys, the customer is providing the key material. So now the customer has the responsibility to make sure that the key material has a high degree of randomness, high degree of entropy. The customer also should keep a local copy of that key material. So um, usually what will happen is when the customer is providing uh, their key material to the cloud service providers, KMS, they will usually wrap that key with a public key that they got from the key management service. So that way they can securely transport the key up to the KMS who will then unwrap that key with a the private key to that key pair. Um, so if you're providing your own key material, you now have the responsibility to protect that key material. When the key material is provided by the cloud service provider, you don't get to see that key material and it's um, virtually impossible for an attacker to see that key material as well. But just like with the case of a customer managed key, now you as the customer can manage the life cycle. There is one advantage though of having a customer provided key. That is you can immediately destroy 
the cloud service provider's copy of the key because the presumption is, is that you have a copy of the key material that you've kept locally, hopefully in something like a local hardware security module. So that is uh, one advantage. Now, the next thought is cryptographic erasure. And in the early days of the cloud, the story wasn't very clear from the cloud service providers as to exactly how they destroyed your data. And uh, I was one of the security architects for a midsize cloud service provider and uh, uh, we didn't have a good story back then either. So basically the thought is, is that if you truly are using strong cryptography to encrypt your data, that means that if you're transferring that data in the presence of an adversary and the adversary gets a hold of it, they cannot break the encryption. So therefore, uh, well, and, and that nobody can break the encryption. So if you destroy the only copy of the key, it would be impossible to decrypt the data. So um, it's for that reason that cryptographic erasure is a technique that is commonly used in the cloud. So going back to my scenario of, let's say you have a hundred petabytes of data. Well, a petabyte of data, by the way, if it was uh, high definition video would take you 13.3 years to watch. So think about how many petabytes of data a company like Netflix has, right? Probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of petabytes of data. So if they were to discontinue their service with AWS, for example, do you think AWS would write ones and zeros over all that data? No, of course they wouldn't. What they would do is they would use cryptographic erasure to destroy the key that encrypts that data. And if you're using a customer managed key or a customer provided key, then you have the ability to um, destroy the key, thereby having the assurance that that data is indeed destroyed. So this gets to the concept of bring your own key. And like many marketing buzzwords, this, uh, this phrase is somewhat ambiguous. So first of all, where are you bringing your key to? Are you bringing your key to the KMS by wrapping it and inserting it? Well, in that case, the KMS now has a copy of your key. Um, are you bringing your own key because you're trying to do client-side encryption? Well, that makes sense, but only for certain use cases as we've already discussed. So when somebody says, well, we're bringing our own key, you got to ask, well, what exactly does that mean? And again, remember my philosophy about security controls. You got to ask yourself, what does this control mitigate and what does it not mitigate? So like in the case of importing your key into the AWS KMS, the one thing that it does buy you is the immediate destruction of your data with the assumption that you kept a local copy of that KMS key. So um, we've got a couple questions that have came into the um, Q&A feature of Zoom. If you have additional questions, now is a good time to actually um, put those in there because I'll be taking a, a few minutes to answer those questions. But first I wanted to mention that again, I teach SEC 510 and we've got some great runs of SEC 510 coming up. Uh, we have Brandon Evans, we'll be teaching uh, it online in September. And then October, I will be at CloudSec Next in Dallas teaching it. And then again in November, we have uh, Brandon teaching it at San Diego in the fall. So let's jump into some of our questions. So um, the first one is from Andy Gill. He said, 
I didn't see it in the agenda summary, which by the way, I mean, I could talk all day long. In fact, I like to about encryption. So um, uh, let's go ahead and jump into this. But another part of the encryption mind trick is the difference between full disk versus getting closer to the actual data, file, uh, field, et cetera, level encryption. Can't tell you how many times I've told folks that the only risk that full disk encryption uh, protects is removing the disk and not being able to punch through the encryptor, encryption wrapper without an o OS account. Absolutely. So that um, let's go back to the slide and maybe uh, this slide will be a great resource for you as you're um, talking about this within your organization. And you can actually use this to walk them through how there's the different threats. So you can flesh out what the different threats are that they're concerned about. And then um, uh, using the axiom that the entity that control that holds the key controls the axis. So in the case that Andy's talking about, in the case of, say, full disk encryption, remember that the operating system is holding the key. So if somebody was able to get stolen credentials and SSH into that system, the fact that that um, full disk or that, in the case of AWS, that RDS, I'm sorry, EBS volume was encrypted is totally transparent to the operating system. So therefore it's totally transparent to the attacker. All right, and then Ross says, how does one really confirm that the connection is really secure considering that there are SSL proxies now available or devices that sit between your device and the server? So the SSL padlock is really not as secure as one thinks. So exactly. So let me go to the encryption in transit slide here. Yeah, so um, the test like SSL labs, that only goes to the that only goes to the load balancer. Yeah, we don't really have that visibility about what's going on behind the load balancer. So that would be an example of that SSL proxy that Ross is talking about. So now the SSL padlock on our browser, what that's telling us is that um, there's no certificate issues with whatever device it is that we're hitting, whether it's that SSL proxy, that load balancer or, or whatever. So again, that's trying to help us be secure, but now for an attacker to exploit the lack of encryption from the load balancer, say to the web server, they would have to be inside the infrastructure. And uh, that is not impossible, but it is much more difficult than simply hitting a web application from the outside, from the internet. Okay, next question. Regarding the comment on application layer security, is homomorphic encryption not ready for prime time? Yeah. Um, so what is homomorphic encryption? That is where the, so often they'll talk about encryption at rest. And that, of course, is um, encrypting the data before you store it. And then you have encryption in transit, and that is um, basically encrypting the channel that the data is going through. Now, you could do both. You could encrypt the data at rest and then send that encrypted file through a, a TLS channel as well. Um, and that's great. But then people talk about, well, encryption in use. And when we mean in use, we're generally talking about holding the data in memory. So remember when I was talking about uh, the services like S3 or EBS, how as soon as they're done using that data key, they wipe it from memory. Well, the goal of homomorphic encryption is to be able to hold the key in an encrypted format in memory and still be able to use it. So homomorphic encryption gets into some pretty interesting uh, mathematics. Um, so um, it's basically if I encrypt um, value A and I encrypt value B and I multiply encrypted value A and B, 
I get encrypted value C. And then if I decrypt encrypted value C, I get was basically the result of A, a times B. So um, very sophisticated mathematics. Um, I believe Google has implemented homomorphic encryption at the research level. There's um, also some privacy concerns. And uh, so uh, for all intents and purposes, I don't know that being used commercially yet. Um, I might be wrong, but I don't believe it is. But remember, why are we encrypting data? We're encrypting data to implement access control. So if we need to be able to sort and index data, I think it's totally fine to use transparent database encryption where the database is holding the key. So, so since it holds the key, it can do the indexing and the sorting and the querying. Um, yeah. And then, uh, oh, I get a note from Brandon. He said, it's not too late to sign up for SEC 510 at Network Security next week in Vegas. And then, uh, good to see you, Brandon. Um, I love teaching your material. Why do you think cloud customers are more concerned that the cloud service provider has access to their key versus other resources? I feel like customers should be more concerned about uh, the cloud service providers access to their other resource types. Well, um, I think what it really boils down to is um, lack of trust. And while the cloud service providers certainly not are not um, perfect, their business model is built on establishing, earning, and maintaining that trust. So, um, to that end, the cloud service providers have created extensive documentation that tries to explain in a transparent way how they do things. So I was teaching, I don't know, this is about uh, four years ago uh, for a course that a cloud course that we've now since deprecated, SEC 545. Um, and I had a security engineer from AWS come up and say, Ken, you know, we we design our system so that no human ever sees uh, data in the clear and no human ever sees uh, key material. And I said, well, granted, and that's wonderful. And I really respect you guys for all the great links and all the uh, the, the controls like supervision, separation of duties and, and all the this design engineering. But at the end of the day, you host these systems. So think back to like Apple, where Apple was potentially being compelled to create a uh, version of the um, iOS operating system that would allow the FBI to be able to decrypt that data, right? So um, since, but at the, at the end of the day, it boils down to, we have to trust our cloud service provider to be able to put sensitive data in the cloud. But I will also be the first one to tell you that there's certain types of sensitive data that do not belong in the public cloud. But for most commercial data, which would include healthcare data and credit card data, I think it is, um, in my judgment, um, fine to put that type of data in the public cloud. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, an anonymous attendee said, one thing I found confusing due to marketing possibly, is the difference between perceived security key management versus key access. The key is as secure as the access controls around it. If we use the most secure HSM option but leave the IEM controls open, then it defeats the purpose of encryption in the first place. Well said, uh, Miss or Mr. Anonymous attendee. Um, that's very cool. And by the way, um, there is a tremendous set of documentation from NIST, uh, NIST Special Publication 857. There's actually three parts and um, very well written. And I mean, it's it's like reading a, a detailed textbook, but it explains things like how to properly manage the key throughout its key lifecycle, um, how to come up with a good key rotation period, and um, uh, auditing the key lifecycle. So lots of great um, 
great material in there. Got another question from Sam about uh, Google proposing 90-day certificate life cycles. Um, what's my opinion on that? Well, um, uh, so there is, Google is part of what is called the um, Browser Certificate Authority Forum, I believe it is. And basically, the various certificate authorities and browser developers collaborate and argue about things like, well, how long should a TLS certificate live? Uh, some people think it should last two years. Others think that it should be relatively short. The one thing with a short certificate life cycle is that I think there'd probably be far fewer expired certificates because if you have to rotate a certificate every 90 days, you're going to use some automation. And I find it quite interesting that even the big guys will occasionally fail to rotate their certificate and the certificate expires. So um, to me, that's not excusable. Uh, people should lose their job over that. Um, of course, we also know that Google is really big on the certificate transparency. So um, pretty amazing uh, program there. So I'm guessing that their recommendations are also in line with the goals of certificate transparency. And then question, how far do you think FIPS 140-2 certifications go in terms of evaluating of elevating trust and using the cloud-hosted KMS Key Vault. Um, well, you have to read the documentation, of course, to find out is it um, FIPS 140-2 level two or is it level three, right? So I think that certainly helps um, from a compliance perspective. But then Google, um, they don't back up their KMS unless you, with with a HSM, unless you specifically require it. So that would be a, a premium upcharge. Because again, what is the purpose of an HSM? It's to well, generate strong keys, but also to um, protect the key at rest. So if your KMS is never at rest, if it's always up and if it's implemented securely, do you need a, H, uh, uh, a hardware security module? Maybe, maybe not, right? So, um, because I, I do believe that the way that Google has implemented their KMS is, is secure, right? They've got a lot of the experts that have written the books on cryptography. So you got to, um, just as, as a token of faith, suspect that they probably know what they're doing. Um, but again, we ourselves have to evaluate this stuff and make sure that it's right for us we got to dig into the details. And I think that as we dig into the details, we can learn a lot in the process and find it to be quite enjoyable. Okay, we are at time. So this has truly been a delight. Again, we will have the slides available for you to download. And um, with that, I will turn it back over to Laura. Wonderful. Ken, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. And uh, it, it helps our community so much. So thank you very much. Everyone who is here, you can download your CPE certificate through your SANS portal under my webcasts. Um, that will be available shortly. And the recording in the slide deck will also be available in the SANS portal in about 48 hours. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon.